For more than 150 years, there have been reports of a half-man, half-ape type creature stalking remote areas of Florida. Much attention has been focused on the Everglades in the south of the state, where in 1997, in one week alone, scores of people claim to have seen a hairy, odorous beast. Could these parts be home to a secret species, one that goes by the name of the swamp or skunk ape? He um, walks like a man, looks like an ape, but smells like a skunk. It's another creature, it's a hominid, it's evolved right along with us, it's a biological creature. Animal X travels to the Big Cypress National Preserve and the small settlement of Ochopee in the Florida Everglades to speak to some of the skunk ape witnesses of 1997. Ochopee Fire Chief Vince Doer was driving along one of the many isolated roads in the preserve on July 21st, 1997, when he saw something cross his path. It was off season in the Everglades the temperature topping 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the humidity at 100%, the mosquitoes as thick as the air. Not a time for anyone to be outdoors. Vince stopped his car for a closer look. It just so happened his camera was handy. I got out with my camera, adjusted it, I yelled at it. By then it was about 400 feet west of the road. It was taking a, a pretty good stride and a fast walk. It was not running, it was not on four, it was just on two, upright. And it kind of turned, and then I snapped the picture that I have. The, and then I only took one shot, one, one picture. I uh, watched it for a few minutes, got back in the truck, and continued on down to the station. This is the image door captured on film. When enhanced, it shows a brown figure walking away from him. Could it be the legendary skunk ape? The Sasquatch of the swamp? High up in his fire tower overlooking the area where he took the photograph, Doerr reflects on what the creature might have been. No, I, I've never seen anything like it before. Uh, I've seen near seeing anything to it would be a bear, but bears, you know, they're on all four. When they move any distance, they go down on four. But if I know what I know now, I would have run after and got closer shots or, you know, but uh, at that time, I just snapped one shot. And a lot of people think that's odd. Uh, I said, well, that just shows you at the time, I just didn't think nothing true about it. Three days before the Dewar incident on July 18th, 1997, a busload of English tourists were sitting in air-conditioned comfort, leisurely taking in the sights of the Everglades. They watched as alligators floated by in swampland and exotic birds flew overhead. Suddenly, two children in the group pointed out something not on the regular sightseeing program. And one of the boys said, Bigfoot, Bigfoot. And he was looking over this way and these trees over here. And it was about, just about here, uh, we saw a creature standing on the edge of the bush there, and uh, it took us by a complete surprise. It looked like a huge gorilla. The sighting lasted just three seconds. Roland decided to investigate further. Then when we recovered, enough to put the vehicle in gear and drive to where I thought I saw it go into the bushes. I drove up and stopped. But it came out again about 50 feet in front of me this time. And this time it halfway loped across the road and then instead turned around and went back into the bushes again. And I looked for it for a couple of minutes, but I couldn't find it. And the mosquitoes were horrific. So I said, the heck with it, got back in the van and took off. Retired Florida police detective and private investigator Bob Smith, now living in Palmyra, Illinois, is a senior member of the BFRO, the Bigfoot Field Research Organization, an elite group of specialized research personnel based in the United States. Together with fellow BFRO curator Diane Stocking, Smith conducted a thorough and critical appraisal of witness reports from the 97 sightings based on his 20 years investigative experience. And their verdict. 
The 97 uh, sightings that happened down in Ochopee, Florida were legitimate sightings as far as the BFRO has conceded. Those, the, the witnesses saw something and from the measurements and the data that was collected from that investigation, it was determined that it was definitely a skunk ape, Bigfoot. It was either one creature moving back and forth or it was a family of creatures because it's our understanding from history and reports that I've read and analysis that these creatures actually move in a family group, contrary to 30 years ago when they were believed to be isolated individual creatures. Extremely hot summer, uh, very mild winter. A lot of mosquitoes, a lot of bugs, and they were probably moving out of the denser swamps where it's a lot hotter and trying to get into a uh, more better area that, that's easier to stay in. The BFRO aren't the only interested party looking to prove the existence of the skunk. Longtime Ochope resident David Sheely is determined in his attempts to provide proof of the existence of a creature he claims to have seen several times. It cannot be just dismissed. There's definitely something. I believe it is a skunk ape. There's definitely something. He's called for a $40,000 government grant to hunt for Florida's Bigfoot and claims to have solid proof in the form of these castings that families of the ape live out in the wilderness. I believe this is a juvenile skunk ape, a young one, and I believe this proves that there's more than one of these things in the Everglades. And based on sightings uh, that I've gotten and reports, I estimate there's upwards six or more of these things in the Everglades region. It's gonna take undisputable physical evidence, in my opinion, to prove to the uh, man on the street that we have an unknown species in the Everglades. James McMullen, a former Vietnam veteran who has spent the past 20 years tracking another elusive creature, the Florida panther, says that indisputable evidence should be in the form of DNA, and right now, he's looking for it. McMullen's decision to jump on the skunk ape trail followed a sighting in the Everglades in August 97, turning him from skeptic to believer overnight. I saw deep, dark brown fur. I didn't see his face, although I wish I could have. He was turned towards me. It wasn't a female because there was no breasts, so he had chest. And um, I could also see the slope, um, what people talk about the cone or the slope going back on the head itself. With so many witness reports, is it possible to one day determine for sure whether families of the skunk ape do indeed exist? The BFRO say it's a difficult task. Unless we can get out and actually start tagging them, there is no way to find out how many is in this state. It could be five, it could be 500. No way of knowing. From mysterious ape men to primates and pets with personality. After the break, Animal X investigates animal emotions. Do creatures experience human feelings? And to what lengths will they go to express them? She feels she's like Mother Teresa. I think if she sees a, an animal who's injured, she wants to go and help it out. Welcome back to Animal X. The animal kingdom is full of amazing creatures that never cease to surprise us. But is it possible they could be more closely related to us than we know? Time now to check out the true feelings behind animal emotions. Our feelings for animals are often very strong. But what sort of feelings do our animals have for us? Are they capable of the same sort of emotions that we experience? Orangutans um, display the full range of emotions that, um, that I've seen in humans. I've always believed that animals have complex emotions. She feels she's like Mother Teresa. Animal X travels to Australia to meet two dogs said to demonstrate some very human emotions, but first to Long Island, New York. Philip Gonzalez is the owner of Ginny, a canine, on an incredible mission to help her natural arch enemies, cats. Ginny's a mixed breed. She's part Siberian Husky and part Schnauzer and part Angel. 
what uh, Ginny would do, which is really strange, was she would see a feral cat who was injured in the streets and she would walk right up to it and start cleaning it and the cat wouldn't bother her or anything like that. This amazingly compassionate dog has rescued over 800 injured or stray cats. At first I thought that uh, she was raised with cats, but the information I got was she was never with any cats before. Ginny did not learn any of this from me because I, at the time I didn't have any cats. I think Ginny, what well, she feels, she's like Mother Teresa. I think if she sees uh, an animal who's injured, she wants to go and help it out. Yeah, she does have emotions that are similar to humans. Like, she has a lot of compassion. Professor Jeffrey Mason is one of the world's leading authorities on animal emotions. I believe that some animals experience emotions that we don't even have access to. I believe that humans have a range of emotion that's probably greater than any other animal. But when it comes to intensity, there are some animals that are our superior. But I believe, for example, the dogs experience friendship more intensely than we do. Kath and James Sutherland of Wembley in Australia live with their dog Shumba. Shumba suffers from extreme anxiety when left alone and will go to extraordinary lengths to find human companionship. When the neighbours came home, they saw Shumba sitting in the garage and they looked around the house and all their fly wire screens had been ripped off. And so they said, Shumba, she's a great dog, she's protected us from robbers. And then they got the police around and the policeman came up to the, our neighbour and said, look, I'm sorry, all we can find are paw prints. So actually the hero of the day, Shumba, actually ended up being the terror of the day and she caused the whole problem. No matter what lengths Kath and James go to, Shumba will always find a way to be with people. It's like uh, me and Houdini at times, because uh, although I try my best, she certainly knows how to crack every combination that I've ever put up there. But un fundamentally I would have said um, she's wanting to be around people. Shumba definitely displays emotions and we've seen that when we've gone away for long periods of time. When we're packing our bags, she knows and she gets really mopey. It'll come back to the clothes that you're wearing. You know, you, you sort of dress for an aeroplane, you pack your bags and yeah, she starts to sort of say, oh yeah, here we go, this is great, I'm going to be left on my own again. I think all dogs have got emotions, but some are just better at expressing them than others and Shumba's very good at expressing her emotions. I've always believed that animals have complex emotions. I can remember going to a zoo at the age of five and thinking, these animals are bored. Now, of course, we recognize, and even zoos recognize, of course animals are bored, and this is why they're constantly trying to enrich their environment to make certain that they don't feel that. And I think that anybody who lives with a cat or a dog or a bird automatically knows that that animal feels emotion. The animals that have emotions closest to ours are probably the animals that resemble us in so many ways. So these are the great apes, the gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans. They clearly have feelings very similar to ours. Leif Cox is a primate expert. He has studied the behavior of orangutans for many years. Although we can never look inside an orangutan's mind to, um, to know exactly what's feeling, just as, as humans, we can't look inside other human beings to um, know exactly how they're feeling. But um, certainly from my experience over many years working with these animals, it would, I find it very hard to describe what they're going through without referring to um, what we call emotions. Orangutans um, display the full range of emotions that, um, that I've seen in humans. I don't believe there are any animals who have no emotions. I'm of the firm belief that all living creatures feel something. If animals do indeed share our emotions, we may be coming closer to understanding why we feel such a strong affinity with them. The true feelings of animals may be hard to fathom. After the break, Animal X presents another enduring enigma, that of frog and fish falls. Are they as mysterious as they appear to be, or is there a rational explanation for them? Out of all the meteorological phenomena that are amazing, animals falling from the sky has got to be one of the most fantastic ones.
Welcome back. Frogs and fish dropping down from the sky may sound like wild fantasy, but it's a phenomenon that has been occurring for centuries. So why do these creatures cascade from the heavens and what's it like to witness such an awesome event? Weather is strange and unpredictable. But what could be stranger than animals falling from the sky with the rain? This strange phenomenon has been recorded since biblical times. Is this an act of God, or does science have a rational explanation? Out of all the meteorological phenomena that are amazing, animals falling from the sky has got to be one of the most fantastic ones. Yeah, I thought, well, what happened here? Who threw these out the car window? Animal X travels to Ipswich in Queensland, Australia, to speak to Harold Deegan, who has witnessed firsthand animals falling from the sky. Harold and his wife, Deborah Deegan, have lived in Ipswich all their lives. This isolated community is a most unlikely place to experience a fish fall. I was thinking about going down, down to the house for dinner from the shed. <laughs> no, just push straight down on the ground. And it was probably 80 foot across, 20 foot long. All these little tiny fish, I thought, well, wow, where did they come from, you know? And you look up and you, surely not out the sky. These were all of a two inch length, all cold, all one thing. So it must have been one school of fish that had got close to the surface, yeah. I don't know how they got delivered right to our house. Yeah, it was a bit of a phenomenon. There's no doubt about that. The Deegans is not an isolated case. There have been hundreds of incidences all around the world. Oliver Crimmin is curator of fishes at the Natural History Museum in London. He has investigated a number of reported cases in Britain. In 1984, people phoned the museum with reports of um, fishes falling from the sky in London. And an investigator went to um, somebody's house in East Ham in London and retrieved fishes from the roof. They are flounders and smelt. Looking at them, these fish, although different shapes, a long, thin smelt and a flat flounder, they're of approximately the same weight, so the, one could imagine they might be graded out um, as they were lifted from the, the, from the water surface. Professor Robert McKinnell is one of the world's leading amphibian experts. There are all kinds of uh, folk tales about amphibians, and a common one is a rain of frogs. I will attempt to make an explanation for you. Here in benign North America, we do have some real weather. I come from an area that's known as Tornado Alley, and tornadoes can really whip up a storm. If this tornado or this whirlwind, a ferocious whirlwind, should go over a pond that has frogs, it will suck up water, and someplace the frogs will come out of the sky. Professor Marcin Zamoski from the Nevada Desert Institute is a meteorological expert. He believes that the answer comes from nature. The tornado or the water spout has to come over just the right location and has to be the right intensity to be able to pick up the living uh, creatures into the final cloud and up into the updraft. A water spout is literally a tornado on water and can reach speeds of over 200 miles per hour. The power of these water spouts is so immense that they can suck up small creatures, such as frogs and fishes, and transport them great distances before sending them back to Earth. The phenomenon is so unusual and so amazing that for a number of years, uh, people considered it to be just a fairy tale or made up stories rather than an actual uh, occurrence. What is even more remarkable is that the animals can survive the ordeal. Fish are quite tough. It's not un impossible that a, a fish would survive that journey. And the frog's not necessarily going to die simply because it's been sucked up in the air. And then when it flops down on the earth, it could, may very well hop away. While it appears that science can provide us with a logical explanation for this strange occurrence, for witnesses of a downpour of animals from the heavens, it remains as mesmerizing as it is mystifying. <laughs>